Hello and thanks for coming to check this out. So this is just going to be a general guide for any beginners out there uh, on how to use the overshoot behavior in Motion 5.4. Uh, first aim here is to show you the information that's provided by Apple in their user guides online just about how the behavior works and what the ramp parameter is supposed to do. And then I'm going to show you other ways you can use it to get more control and more choices in the animations that you want to make. Um, after I put this up, I am going to post a guide and project file for making this pop-up city here and also the clock and these pop-up leaves as well. So if you're interested in that, then check back later and I will have those up soon. Alright, then let's get busy and see how the overshoot behavior works. First of all, let's look at using the overshoot behavior on the scale of an object to give us that popular bouncing and popping in effect. So I'll grab the square, I'll come to properties. Note that before we do anything, the square is at 100% scale. Okay, so I'll grab this menu next to the scale option and I'm going to choose add parameter behavior overshoot. Uh, in the timeline, the behavior is running the full length of the project, which is 10 seconds. I want it to be just one second long, so I'll trim it. And our project is 30 frames a second, so I've just made the behavior 30 frames long. So let's look at these values here, start value and end value. So what are they all about? I mean, we're working with scale. We're at the start of the behavior here in the timeline. If the scale here is at zero, why can I still see the rectangle? Okay, so these values relate to this value that we noted earlier. Zero percent here means we're leaving this as it is. It means no percent up and no percent down from this value. So if I want to make it so my rectangle is not visible with zero scale in the beginning of the behavior, I want to set this start value to the exact opposite of this value. So we've got 100 percent here. I'm going to come in here and set this value to minus 100%. And now when I play the project, there's our pop-in behavior that we wanted. And you note that the animation ends with the square back to its normal size. That's because we left this end value at zero. So what is this ramp duration all about? All right, so by default in motion, it's at 35%. And that has nothing to do with this value. It's everything to do with the duration of the behavior. So remember our behavior is trimmed to one second, so it's 30 frames long. So 35% ramp duration means we are giving 35% of the frames to this part here, the scaling in part. So the higher the ramp value means the more time is spent scaling in our case um, because we've set it to scale here. So then 35% of 30 frames is 10 and a half frames and yep, right here between the 10th and 11th frame the bouncy part kicks in. So by that if I set ramp duration to 10% then we would expect it to kick in on the third frame and that's what's happening. And if I set it to 50%, then we would expect it to kick in here as it is doing on the 15th frame. So 50% here's a good example. Our project is 30 frames long, so at 50%, we are giving it 15 frames to scale and 15 frames to bounce around. So for you, when you're planning your projects, um, what it means is that if you want uh, a big bouncy, very visible, very exaggerated overshoot effect, choose a low ramp. If you want a more constrained and subtle effect, then choose a higher ramp value. That's the way I see it. Cycles. Okay, so you can see the peaks here. Our, our cycles are set to one, two, three. So you see the peaks here? One, two, three. That's just how many times you want the 
behavior to overshoot that original value. Okay, let's bring it to the end where it's back to 100. So cycles is how many times do you want it to overshoot its true scale value? And you can see we've got one, two, three here. Um, if I bring cycles to just one, well then we're just going to get this big soft bounce right at the end of it. Start offset and end offset, we're not going to worry about that right now. Acceleration, alright, so look at the ramp part of our behavior and if I play with the acceleration then we are getting some interpolation changes happening here. So through the acceleration control you have some influence over the look and feel of the animation but in my opinion not much and that's a step we're going to look at later. So that's some um, basic application of overshoot to uh, the scale of an object and that is what all of these values are about, the start value, end value, ramp duration, and cycles, and acceleration. All right, so let's have a look at using overshoot to move an object along the x-axis. I'm going to grab our blue square and duplicate it, and I'll turn off the original and move it down here out of the way. I'm going to grab this copy of the overshoot we just made and change its attention from scale to properties, transform, position, x-axis. Okay, I'll make this square a bit smaller and I'm gonna move it up here. So now I'm dealing with uh, moving along an axis. I want to pay attention to the end value. So I'll bring my play here to the start um, start value is at zero, so it's going to begin where it was, where I put it. End value is what I want to work with, so I'm going to move my playhead to the end. And by adjusting the end value, I can see how far along I'm going to animate the object. Uh, we're ramped at 50%, so this is the animation we're getting. Okay, and I can influence to some extent how that animation along looks by playing with the acceleration here. And it would be pretty much the same if we work with the y-axis. Let's jump straight into uh, rotation. I'm going to duplicate this object, turn that one off. Alright, I'm going to grab this chap and just uh, move them. I'll grab that overshoot behavior first and I'm going to change it from transform position to transform rotation Z. All right, and I'll move them into the canvas. We can see things a bit better. Uh, so, right, working with the rotation. Um, so these Start and end values, again, they're going to relate directly to whatever this value is. Um, so we're starting with no rotation in its natural properties. So then we're starting at zero, so we're leaving it alone. End duration is what we want to look at here. So I'm going to set this value to 45%. So at the end of one second, 30 frames, our object will have rotated 45% and bounce around. And it's going to kick in on the 15th frame, the bouncy part. And what have we done with acceleration here? Okay, if we ramp that acceleration up, we get a very subtle change in the animation itself. So there we go, that's the basic application of overshoot to the scale, x-axis and rotation of an object.
Okay, so now let's look at some other ways to use the overshoot behavior that will give you more options and more flexibility with your animations. So we've got three shapes again, and they're doing the same thing as before, scaling and rotating and animating along an axis. But I think, as you can see, uh, things look more dynamic and more interesting than before. So let's have a look at the shape that's scaling first to see what's going on. And what we've done uh, is we've keyframed the scaling and at the end of the keyframing we've added an overshoot behavior to take over and give us the bouncy part. So by using keyframes uh, we can edit a curve and get a better looking animation than what is possible from just using this acceleration parameter and the overshoot behavior itself. It's a more kinetic and dynamic animation. Okay, the same thing or similar things happening with the shape that's animating along the X position. Uh, because we keyframe, we can give it a more interesting curve here. And the overshoot behavior is taking over at the end of the keyframing. And with the rotation, the shape uh, begins slowly and then tips over into the final rotation. And the overshoot gives us the bouncy effect at the end of it. And that's a much more interesting uh, animation than we can get by relying on the overshoot behavior to do everything for us. So as you can see, by combining keyframing with the overshoot behavior, it opens up a lot of doors and gives you uh, a lot more choice and variety with your animations. So thinking about that, um, to give you some ideas about what you can do. Let's have a look at these things here. Uh, so we've got this clock here, and what's happening with the clock is that we are using the spin behavior to make the second hand move from point to point. And there is an overshoot behavior taking over after the spin behavior to give us that slight wiggle of the second hand. In this popping leaves animation, the overshoot behavior is applied just to the Y scale. So the leaves are animating from the anchor point, which is set down here. Let's grab a leaf to see. So you see the anchor point is set to the bottom, and the overshoot is applied only to the Y scale. So it's giving us that uh, nice effect. And here in the pop-up city animation, this kind of diorama animation, we've got lots of different elements and they all combine keyframing with the, with the overshoot behavior. And by combining keyframing with the overshoot behavior, each element can have its own kind of personality within the animation. Um, for example, the smaller objects and the hills are keyframed uh, with their X and Y scale, but these tall objects are just keyframed and with the Y scale, so they shoot straight up compared with the others. And the overshoot behavior is applied just to the Y scale, with the other ones get the X and Y. And everything runs with its own timing because we've used keyframing rather than the overshoot behavior itself.
Right, so that's it. Um, I hope this was useful for you. Again, as I said, it's just a basic guide to how to use the overshoot behavior. As usual with motion, something that's so simple like the overshoot behavior, there's really so many options and so many possibilities when you dig into it. All right, well, I hope that gives you some ideas for your future projects, and thanks for watching.